As much as I love to review newer games coming out, sometimes I just want to revisit a classic regardless of the view count. Today, it is time to finally review one of my favorite games of all time, Romancing Saga Minstrel Song. Originally released in 2005 for the PS2, this fairly obscure JRPG was not only one of my favorite games on the system, but probably also one of my favorite RPGs of all time. I've done a tier list of the series prior, but I've always wanted a separate video on this game specifically. Thankfully, it was given a proper remastering in 2022 and brought to the glorious PC with upscaled resolution and many quality updates, making it the definitive way to play the game. There's honestly just a ton that I want to talk about, so let's dive right in. When you start out the game, you are given the choice between playing the game vanilla or with the added content. Why you wouldn't want the new content? I'm not sure outside of purest reasons. You will also be able to choose one of eight characters as your main character. You can recruit the other ones if you want to, but more on that part later. While the Saga series has never had a strong narrative focus, the characters are incredibly memorable. I debated on who to choose, but we want to do this review proper. We have to choose the Valkyrie of Valhalla, the almighty legend herself, Sif. I am Sif. A proud Valhalla. I can honestly do a whole separate video on why she's just so awesome, but I can at least dedicate a paragraph or two. In terms of appearance, Sif is definitely one of the most unique looking female characters in any genre, especially for JRPGs. She is certainly an imposing figure with the amount of muscle she carries. I don't think I can dedicate that many hours she does to her physique, so my hat's off to her. And due to her physique, she is one of the strongest characters on the battlefield in terms of raw strength and vitality. Her charisma attribute also grows pretty quickly, making her pretty good at illusion magic of all things. Sif easily checks out the appearance part, combining beauty with brawn, but what about her personality? Honestly, she's far more complex than what is shown on the surface. While, yes, she is someone who prefers to use her fist than passive solutions, she has also shown many times to be an overall kind person. She would risk her life in the face of fear simply because it's the right thing to do. Hey, I never let a teammate down. Sif shows a ton of respect to people she believes are mentally strong, and the voice acting for her captures the character perfectly. You may be just a boy, but you speak like a man. Good. Come. She also just doesn't respect cowardice or evil, which leads to some pretty badass moments. If the world I live in is hell, it's still not that bad of a place. But to be a puppet on a string just like you is far from my idea of paradise. Alright, back to the game proper. Depending on your character you choose determines your starting quests and conditions. For Sif, she has to clear out the monster caves, which eventually leads to a shipwreck off the coast where she finds another one of the main characters named Albert. Once he returns to form, he asks to join Sif. You can actually say no here, but I needed the help since it was only myself, a no-name barbarian, and the titular minstrel. Fun fact, the minstrel is voiced by Richard Cassino which has also voiced Kenshin Himura and Pang Tong respectively. Taking a quick detour to the voice acting, I'm honestly impressed with the level of voice acting here. Every line of dialogue is fully voiced, which some RPGs released today still resort to using text boxes. The quality of voice acting here is honestly fairly mixed. While there are great performances from the likes of the minstrel and even Sam Regal voicing a character, much of the one-off characters don't carry the same level of command. Considering this game was originally made with Japanese voice acting, this may be more due in part to translation errors or just a lack of time between the Japan and American dubbing. Like I said prior, we have a ton to get through, so let's just get to the combat. When you come into contact with an enemy on the field of battle, you will initiate combat. Similar to many other JRPGs of the genre, this is done in a turn-based manner. Early game, you will only have your basic attack to work with, but eventually will unlock more attacks to use known as techs. Each tech will require a certain amount of BP points to use, which regenerate each turn. Depending on the character and stats will determine your starting BP, your maximum BP, and how much it regenerates per turn. Characters like Claudia regenerate at a very high BP amount, while Sif is more to the mid to low range, but starts off with four more each battle. Each character in your party has health points and life points. When your health points decrease to zero, the character is knocked out until revived by another party member or a benediction of some kind. Getting knocked out will reduce your overall life points. If your life points reach zero, the character is removed from the party and will need to be recruited again. I haven't had this happen to me yet, but I've definitely lost way more battles than I would like to admit. 
It may seem like a fairly standard system at play, but I've only scratched the surface. What I honestly love about this game is how every character can equip every weapon regardless of their stats. Heck, they don't even need a weapon and can just use their fists to become a deadly martial artist. The flexibility here is just amazing, especially compared to other JRPGs that usually restrict each character to have exactly one weapon type. For Sif here, I started with two-handed swords, then experimented with unarmed combat, until I ultimately settled with my final weapon, which ended up being an incredibly powerful polearm. I'm still not even done yet. You can even set up formations before each battle. Characters can either be positioned at the front, middle, or back row. For my main party setup, I had Sif and Dragon Knight in the front row, followed by Grey in the middle. Rounding it out, I had my Archer Claudia and Spellcaster Aisha in the back. And if you're wondering what happened to Albert, I kicked them out of the party. The Minstrel was also just a temporary party member until I got the characters I wanted, but he still played an integral part of this game, hence why he's in the name of the game. And even that isn't the full extent of formations. Depending on the locations can lead to some combo attacks, and those combos can eventually turn into super combos known as vortexes. While these are incredibly satisfying to pull off, there's an element of RNG for this to actually happen. Even picking the correct attacks will result just in every character performing their attack with no combo at all. There's one quest in particular where you need to perform a very specific vortex and the game makes fun of you as you struggle to figure it out. Once you do, it's just luck for it to actually happen. I do notice, however, that combos tend to happen more against weaker enemies than stronger enemies. Maybe there's some hidden math or variable going on, but I'm not sure. There's even more variations on attacks with surges, fulcrums, and even divine intervention from the gods themselves. Again, most of this is based off of RNG or some cryptic calculations, but are always appreciated when they happen. While I did say that your characters can equip whatever weapon that they deem necessary, your characters will still need the correct training to properly wield them. Training a character in the weapon you want them to specialize in will allow the character to use attacks with less of a chance to lower the weapon's durability, as well as reduce the amount of BP certain attacks need. This is incredibly crucial, especially in the mid to late game where every advantage is necessary. You will need a currency known as jewels to accomplish this, which can be gained in battle but is mainly gained through completing quests. Training is also important to qualify for certain classes and use certain proficiencies. Each class comes with its own benefit like being able to block more attacks or preventing enemies from performing combos. One in particular that I found pretty cool was the merging of spells. This allowed my mage character Aisha to improve her water blast spell into a more powerful variation. Proficiencies are skills that are used when traversing the world. Certain dungeons may require the use of client or jumping. Other proficiencies can allow the party to sneak by enemies while others will uncover chests. Some chests may have traps that need to be disarmed or locks that need to be picked. Equipping the correct proficiencies is important, although some of this can feel like trial and error. It's hard to really know what exactly if jumping or climbing will be relevant. If it's your first time going through a certain area, there's no way to know if it'll be worth it. I wish the remaster gave the player some sort of hint on recommended proficiencies. While you'll be spending a ton of jewels on training your skills and unlocking classes, you'll be using that cash money boah, on purchasing and upgrading equipment. For how little health you start out with in this game, it's better to focus heavily on defense early. Sure, a glass cannon strategy can work, and I actually did this for a good portion of my playthrough, but armor is definitely your best friend. There's also a ton of unique equipment you can gain from completing quests and opening chests, so definitely pay attention to them. Now, I would be careful early on in investing too heavily in characters other than your main one. As I mentioned before, I got rid of Albert and the Minstrel along with the Valhallen warrior that was accompanying me. You can find various companions located across the world, but mainly they can be found at various pubs. I took in Claudia to be my archer due to needing one, as well as Aisha for magic support. I also made Aisha my main healer due to her high compassion. Grey was originally intended as a temporary companion, but proved to be far too valuable to let go due to his overall growth. There are also a ton of side characters to recruit, and even more were added in the remaster. Dragon Knight is a pretty obscure choice for many, but his unique attributes and attacks made him an interesting choice that synergizes well with the party. Upgrading equipment sounds awesome, but it's actually something I recommend not to do with your weapons. You can add various materials to your weapons with varying effects. The problem is each weapon has durability. If you use skills that use up DP, which you most likely will early on, 
then you would need to repair it. This is fine if you don't temper your weapons, but if you do, you'll need to repair it using that specific material. It's honestly far more frustrating than it's worth, although there is one character that is based around restoring a katana. Armor, however, does not need to worry about durability, so feel free to add any materials you'll like. And now let's get into traversing the world properly. I've already mentioned how proficiencies can get you through certain obstacles and how running into enemies on the field triggers a battle, so I won't get into that again. When you start out, only a small portion of the world is revealed. For Sif, she will stay in Shiverlin until she is given a map by the village elder. The map opens up Eugenstadt with other locations opening up depending on who has been recruited, various NPCs, and taking a boat to the location. It's an interesting way to unlock the world, although it can feel pretty confusing early on in terms of where to go. And it's honestly why I think Minstrel Song and the whole Saga franchise gets routinely overlooked here in the US. It can be incredibly confusing and daunting on where to go next. The game is full of so many quests, with some of them being far more difficult than others, as well as being time sensitive. Back in the PS2 days, there was a hidden variable called Event Rank. Basically, this determines what quests are available and what enemies you'll face in combat. The higher the ER, the harder the enemies get, and the closer to the end you'll get. ER is ultimately determined by a number of battles you are in, so if you want to keep a low ER, you would have to actively avoid battle. Thankfully, this variable is no longer hidden and displays in the menu on where you are in the cycle. I'm still not the biggest fan of this system personally, but at least it isn't as hidden as the original release. Even some of the quests themselves are not as obvious as to what you should do next. There is a journal you can look at, but it doesn't always tell you what the next step is until you figure it out yourself. One quest that I had required the use of an inn where I had to sleep there in order to discover a location to complete it. I don't even recall how I discovered this initially, I think I just did it as a guess and the rest of the quest completed basically as I expected. I went to the area, defeated the bosses, and got a pretty good payday. Most of this honestly didn't really become much of a problem until the very end. Once you reach ER 20, you can get one of three quests depending on your alignment to the gods, another variable that has remained hidden. Two of these quests are easily explained while one of them isn't even listed as a quest at all. The minstrel often tells a ton of stories about the lore of the world, so I figured it was just another one of those. Unfortunately, that was actually what I was supposed to seek out, and I had to go online to learn how to discover the location. After that, I was fine, but this honestly soured the experience. While there are quests that can be frustrating, there are others that highlight the world of Romancing Saga and the great characterization within. I won't spoil anything, but there is one quest in particular that is very heartfelt and has a beautiful story. Sure, it involves fantasy elements as expected, but it was a story that I could relate to and it had a strong emotional conclusion. When it comes to the remaster, there are a ton of improvements that make this a far more accessible and enjoyable experience. So much information is given to the player than ever before, as well as some much appreciated quality of life features. You can now speed up the game, which makes both battles and traversing the world much quicker. I always felt that your characters needed a run button. While this isn't a 100% it, it still makes traveling far less tedious now. You can also quick save the game with just a quick press of a button as well as an autosave function. Both are great improvements that cut down on the tedium. Square Enix has always been able to deliver absolutely breathtaking pieces, and Romancing Saga is no exception. Heck, the whole Saga series has several iconic tracks that stick with me for years and years. What ultimately sticks out to me with this soundtrack is its variety. There are so many songs played throughout the game that do a great job of highlighting each situation. The boss themes especially have an extensive range of instruments and genres. For example, the track Passionate Rhythm relies completely on guitar work while the final boss's theme features electronica and heavy metal elements fused together. The battle with death theme is also one that is very orchestral and wouldn't be out of place in a Final Fantasy game. It's more than impressive seeing such a huge range of music all fitting into the game masterfully. All of these songs were composed and arranged by Kenji Ito, who definitely deserves his flowers. Unfortunately, I can't really say the same for the graphics. While the animations during battles and colors used are great, the character proportions are just odd specifically for humans. Kids in this game have it the worst with these giant ass bobbleheads that look silly. I get it was a stylistic choice, but it doesn't work here for me. Most of the creature's designs, on the other hand, look really good and some are downright impressive to look at. I like how Dragon Knight looks in particular since he just looks really cool. 
Even after you've beat the game and saved the world, there's still seven more characters to go through, each with their own personality and skills. You will not only get a boost in stats and can choose any class you've unlocked, you can also find even more quests that can only be triggered after completing certain quests in a prior playthrough. There were honestly some that just blew me away once I discovered them. Despite all that I've mentioned so far in this review, there's still a ton more to discover, but I'll leave that up to you to find out. The beauty of Romancing Saga is discovering the game and finding all the hidden surprises within. Even after completing my fourth playthrough, I'm still ready to get back into the world and play as another character. Even though my party was incredibly strong at the end, there were still certain characters like Jamil that would have been a great substitution for Dragon Knight and even some of the newer companions introduced in the remaster. While I do wholeheartedly recommend it to any RPG or JRPG fan, it definitely does take some time to get used to. Even being a veteran myself, I had to adjust to some of the game's quirks and really get creative with how I approach the game. Still, it's an amazing experience from beginning to end that still resonates with me to this day. It's even a bit of an in-joke with my friends when I say, but what about that romance in Saga? Either way, thank you for all for watching the video. If you did enjoy the video, let me know in the comments below if I should take a look at the Saga Frontier remaster. I actually beat all the characters for that one, so I definitely do have a lot to say about that game. Thank you guys for watching as always, and this is Powerhouse, signing off.